Good afternoon and welcome to the latest Yellowstone Advisory webinar with Graham Clark, CEO of Emerson PLC. Before I hand over to Graham, I just want to go through a few admin points. You're all currently on listen-only mode, but if you do want to ask a question, please type it into the chat box at the bottom of your screen and we'll try and deal with all questions at the end of the presentation. The format today is a presentation from Graham, which will, which will last approximately 30 minutes, and then we'll hand over to a Q&A. And then following the meeting, you'll be redirected to a short anonymous survey, and it would be really appreciated if you could spend a few moments completing this. So without further delay, I'm really pleased to hand over to Graham Clark, CEO of Emerson PLC. Graham. Hello. Hello, just, hello everybody. I'll just uh, get my screen up. Um, okay, so hopefully that's uh, working. Um, okay, right, so I'm going to talk this afternoon about the Chemiset project in Northern Morocco. Uh, this is the, the primary focus of, of Emerson PLC. It's a potash, um, potash project. Um, just by means of introduction, um, sort of high level points here on this first slide. Um, I'll just put this onto slideshow, sorry. Okay, not better. Um, so it's based on the fundamentals that there's an increasing demand for potash, and this is as a result of the world's growing population, the need for more food, and I'll cover this in a bit more detail on, on one of the, the slides uh, coming up shortly, but we need to grow more food. The only way to do that is by applying more fertilizer um, so that we increase crop yields, and then we can, we can feed the, the growing population. So that's the fundamental behind this project. There is always going to be a need for potash, always going to be an increasing need. Uh, for potash uh, to go on to agricultural land. That opens up the need, therefore, for new, well-located sources of supply. The current large producers can produce um, additional product, but with a 2 to 3% increase in, in demand year on year, there is the opportunity for a, a project the size of, of the Chemiset project. One or two of those every year wouldn't fill the increasing demand. We're going to produce around 735,000 tonnes um, of potash product MOP per year, um, and that will, will only go part way to, to fulfill the, the increasing need for potash. Project has outstanding economics, and that was confirmed in the feasibility study that was completed in June of last year. Um, and I'll go, I'll cover off the, the sort of reasons behind the fact that it is a, you know, an outstanding project in, in the potash development space a bit, a bit later on. We have a small team, and there's, there's always been a small team working on this project, but we have all of the expertise in place uh, to take the project forward towards construction. We'll add to the team as we need to. But one of the things that we really focused on is making sure that we keep the team lean. And we have the right people with the right motivation to, to get the best value out of this project. And currently with the, the price, the share price as it is, the project, given where it is in the development pathway is actually um, quite substantially undervalued. So just talking a bit more about the, the, need for the need for the product. So population growth means we need higher crop yields and we need more potassium replacement. So the potash is the potassium that, that all, all crops need to grow. Just a, a little bit about that. So the vast majority of fertilizer that's applied, it, it sort of is formulated around nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. So NPK fertilizers, anybody that buys fertilizer for their tomatoes in the greenhouse or or to put on their vegetables in the garden, will be applying nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium at the very least. Those are three of the six macronutrients that all, all plants, no matter where they are in the world, they need those nutrients to grow. Some of the nutrients are available in the soil naturally, but as the plants grow, they take the nutrients from the soil, they therefore need replacing, and that's why we need to apply fertilizers. So at the moment, globally, the amount of farmland per capita is shrinking. It's also shrinking in real terms. So we have to produce more from less. And the only way to do that is by applying fertilizers to increase the yields. And, and, and globally, we need to produce 60% more food than we're producing today by 2050. 
And, and food security is a major issue for a lot of the, the large uh, countries around the world where they have the, you know, the, the increasing populations. The little graph there on the right hand side of the screen shows that over the last 15, 20 years, um, fertilizer has been applied in, in greater quantities um, and it has to continue to, to increase. And that's distorted by a lot of the sort of more advanced uh, farming areas, North America, Europe, where fertilizer is applied in a, a very scientific way um, to, to, to maximize the yields. But as an example, a lot of the available agricultural land in the world is in Africa, um, and the application rates are about a tenth of, of that average that's, that's shown on that chart, and that has to increase going forwards. So this, this graph just shows the, the fact that the potash demand is going to increase, and this is, you know, this is all of the analysts, uh, no matter where they are, forecast a, an, an increase. So that's around 2% per annum going forwards. So in 2019, around 73, 74 million tonnes of potash now was, was produced and con consumed, and that's going to increase to just under 100 million tonnes by 2033. So huge opportunity there for, for new production to come online and start to fulfil some of that increased demand. Just looking here, and you know, all, all crops, as I said, need, need potassium, need the potash to be applied. Um, and these graphs here, these just show the increase in uh, price from, from crops, some of the, the main crops that, that we all rely on. So wheat, soybeans and corn, they're the part of the staple diet across, across the world. And you can see since the middle of last year, um, the crop prices have continued, have, have started to increase fairly substantially. This always drives an increase in the potash price, fertilizer price in general. And no matter where the farmers are around the world, they work on, on margins. They have to get a better price for their, for their crops so they can apply more fertilizer to increase the yield. Um, and that's at the moment, you can see that that's happening and that's actually driving um, both the price upwards and also uh, continuing to drive the demand up. So our location, the location of our project is, is really important and it is um, of strategic advantage to us. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that um, in a moment, but we're in Morocco. In Morocco, there's a, the government put in a, a plan a few years ago called the Green, Green Morocco, which was to put a lot of money into developed farming and agriculture in the country. They are dependent, it's one of the, the large parts of their economy. But Africa as a whole, as I've said, Africa has a lot of the available agricultural land in the world and is going to have to become a major exporter of food if we're able to meet the demand uh, to feed the growing population elsewhere in the world. And, you know, the, the application rates are very low and they're going to have to increase substantially. And that gives us, given we're in Northern Africa, there is no potash produced in Africa currently on the African continent. So our target is to be the first um, producer of, of potash on the continent. And it's very easy to see that uh, there'll be a, a very local demand for our product. And the graph on the right really confirms that. This is just looking at Morocco and the increase in MO, MOP, uh, potash product that we're going to make, imported into Morocco uh, over the last 10 years or so. And there's been a significant increase up to around the 800,000 to a million tonnes per annum. And given that we're producing 735,000 tonnes, that's less than Morocco is, is currently importing into the country. This is driven to a large extent by OCP. OCP are the world's largest phosphate producer, so they produce the phosphorus, that, the phosphorus nutrient that all plants need. Um, and they've actually become, over the last eight to 10 years, a fertilizer producer as well. So not just producing the, the phosphate, the phosphorus input into MPK fertilizers, but they're also importing uh, potash, the K, um, and they've got nitrogen from, from gas supplies to produce the MPK fertilizers. So we potentially have um, a customer very, very close to the project in Northern Morocco. And just talking a bit more about, about agriculture in Morocco. So the Green Moroccan Plan, that's to generate growth in the agricultural sector. And agriculture is, is around 20% of Morocco's economy. I think a lot of people see Morocco as a sort of desert, a very dry country, but, but it's far from that. Yes, there is um, areas that are, are desert, but there's irrigation systems schemes in place and some very fertile land. Um, it's one of the major employers in the country. 
And over the last five years or so, there's been a significant increase in the export exports of both vegetable, vegetables and fruit. And you know, I go go to the local supermarket here, um, and you see a lot of products that are coming from Morocco. So Africa will become a major food producer and exporter, uh, and Morocco is leading the way to some extent in that currently. Another aspect of, of Morocco is renewable energy. Um, there's a lot of sunshine there, certainly a lot more than we're having in this country at the moment. So over 3,000 hours per year of sunshine, and you can see those two um, photographs there, the images, one showing a, a very large um, solar, uh, solar power and also wind generation. So 42% of electricity in Morocco is now renewable. And the, our aim is that, that we will use all renewable energy for the, for the project. Um, we have an MOU in place with one producer, but there are numerous other renewable energy producers in Morocco talking to us. Um, and we're very keen that we, we use all renewable energy to, uh, to power both the, the mine and the process plant when we're in operations, which obviously reduces our carbon footprint and it, it is absolutely the right way for us, us to proceed with the project. This sort of rather simple schematic on this slide um, really sums up the, the project, um, why it is such a good project economically, both in terms of, of the capital cost, the risk of the development, but also once we're in operations, why we are uh, one of the lowest cost producers of potash in the world. So just starting on the left here, we can, we're comparing the Chemiset project in Morocco with a typical Canadian potash project. Um, and the differences are, are, are very clear on this graphic. So here, this the favorable geology comes into play. So the deposit that, that we're going to, to extract is around 500 meters below surface. So we can, we can access it relatively easily. But very importantly, there are no aquifers. So no water bearing strata between the surface and the, the seam itself. So we can actually access the deposit using two declines or drifts. So those are angled roadways going from surface down into the deposit, mined using conventional mining equipment um, through very stable ground. And the, the cost, of us to act, cost for us to access the deposit um, is around $35 million. If you look at a typical Canadian mine or in the UK, the, the Serious Minerals, now Anglo-American project, deep shafts having to go through an aquifer to actually access the deposit. So those are very high cost and also high risk because to go through an aquifer, you either have to freeze the ground before you put the shafts through it, or you have to grout it as you go to seal off um, the water from the shafts and so you can keep the mine dry and safe in the future. And a cost for, for two shafts to, to access a deposit in, in Canada would be around a billion dollars, very similar to the, to the costs on the Sirius Minerals project. So very high cost, very high risk. So another aspect, and, and this is where the geography of the, and the location in Morocco comes into play, there's really well-established infrastructure in Morocco. So we're less than 15 kilometers from a major power distribution network, and the site sits alongside a, a well-developed highway uh, that gives us really good access down up to the coast and to the port. So we have very low costs in terms of infrastructure costs, 12, 13 million dollars for us to uh, connect to the power grid and also to the, to the highway. And if you look at a, a typical Canadian project um, where they're a very long way from, from a lot of things, they'd be spending a couple of hundred million dollars to access a rail uh, connection and to establish power at the site. So another substantial saving in terms of the capex. So low capex, our capital cost is, is just over $400 million to develop this project. Um, and that you know, is a saving of, of one and a half to $2 billion against an equivalent sort of project in Canada. On the right-hand side of this, um, of this slide, we show the operational advantage that we have. And here we're comparing the cost of us shipping our pro product to one of the major markets, which is Brazil. As I've already said, because of the, the market, ready market in Morocco itself, but also in, in Africa, um, it is very unlikely that our product will ever go to Brazil. But this is just to show the advantage that we have um, from a cost perspective compared to the, to the major incumbent producers. So for us to get our product from the site, 135 kilometers by road to the port of Casablanca and to ship to Brazil, cost us around $24 a ton. 
One of the things in, in Morocco is that the government is very supportive of foreign direct investment um, and they understand the mining industry very well. So there's a basically a nominal royalty only in place. So virtually no royalty costs for us. So very cheap for us to export to one of the major markets. Compare that to a Canadian producer, either a new one or the, the large established Canadian producers that we already have in existence. They've got around 1700 kilometers by rail to get to the port. They have $25 a ton royalty costs to the Saskatchewan government. So their royalties are higher than our total logistics costs uh, to take the product to Brazil. And then they have to ship from Vancouver down through the Panama, Panama Canal uh, to get to the Brazilian market. And that's gonna cost them around $105 a ton. So we have an $80 a ton advantage over the major Canadian producers, which puts us when we're in operations right down at the bottom of the cost curve um, and very competitive, no matter what the potash price is. And given that we have markets much closer uh, to home than Brazil, uh, our logistics costs would be even lower than that. And that would give us uh, more of an advantage still. So combination of the geology and the geography make this low cost in terms of the development costs, low risk in terms of the development because mining two declines largely through an upper salt deposit to access the potash is about as low risk a development as you could get for an underground mine. And then once we're in operations, because of the location and the logistical advantage, we're right down at the bottom of the cost curve in terms of, of the global producers. Piece of work we've, we've done recently. So the feasibility study we did in June, um, so very detailed piece of work, identified the a 19 year mine life for a 735,000 tons per annum um, project, $412 million uh, for the construction. But recently we had a, had a look at the opportunities, if there was an opportunity for a phase development of this project. And this was partly to look at potentially a, a, a smaller startup operation, but more importantly from my perspective was to look at the opportunities to expand once we've actually got, uh, got the project up and running. And that was to bring in um, additional de-icing salt, convert some of the, uh, the MOP, the potassium chloride, into potassium sulfate, SOP, which is a, a higher value multinutrient product because it has sulfur as well as the potassium, but also ultimately to look at expanding the production output uh, by bringing in another area of the resource that we have. Our initial 19 year life is from less than 50% of the resource that we have uh, access to now the permission to mine with the, the mining license. So it was to look at how we could actually uh, develop the project, expand in phases uh, to end up with a, a much larger project, which you know captures the, the real value and the real potential of the Chemiset project. So what we, we did in this work, we've identified that potentially, yes, we could have a, a smaller project to start, start with, with um, around 350,000 tonnes of, of production. Um, and we could do that for a cost of uh, around $255 million. And then potentially we could expand the projects using cash flow from, from that initial operation. And ultimately in phase four, which is where we've increased the production of potash, we've got SOP and additional salt, and we've got some detailed uh, slides to show that in a moment. We have an MPV of around 2.37 billion, um, EBITDA 491 million, and it, you know, what we've done in, in this work is, is demonstrate the real potential of this project and, and where this could be um, in the future, which is with the potassium sulfate and multinutrient fertilizer producer selling the icing salt uh, and generating a huge amount of cash. Um, so we will continue to do some more work on this. Um, we're doing more detailed work on the SOP and also looking at increasing the opportunity to sell the icing salt uh, to, to North America. This chart just shows the, the four phases. Um, so initial production um, generating uh, revenues of, of around 300, um, of, of around 100 million. Um, CapEx uh, under 300 million, as I've said. And then with the cash flow potentially feeding into the phase two development and upwards to phase four, so certainly phase three and four would be, would be could be developed entirely uh, from the cash flow generated from phase two. And phase two is, 
is effectively the project that we identified in the feasibility study. So uh, average of 735,000 tonnes of MOP per year, um, total cost of, um, if developed in, in one go, of around 412 million, but that's basically the feasibility study level. And then we increase um, in the, the phase three and phase four. Slightly um, different way of looking at it here. And really this just shows where we are uh, in terms of our valuation at the moment. So this shows the, the sales and the capex for the, for the phases, um, increasing up to phase four. And the green line is our EV EBITDA um, multiple. And the green line assumes that the share price stays around where it is, around the 6p mark. Um, and what we have to bear in mind here is that all existing potash producers, the incumbent producers, their EV EBITDA is around 10, a multiple of 10, and they, they hold that very steadily because it's a very consistent business driven by the, you know, a demand that stays stable and increases year on year. It's a product that we all need. Without it, we won't be able to eat in the future. So it is, it's fundamentally, um, it's a really good business, potash business to be in. So they traded a multiple of around 10. So this just shows where we sit today and, and what the value of this, this company would be once we're into operations and, and we become a, a potash producer. So this slide, I won't go through all of the details here, but this just picks up the, the four phases. So 350,000 tons of MOP in phase one. We add 385 in phase two, so that takes us up to the feasibility study level of, of 735,000 tonnes of MOP, and we add a million tonnes of de-icing salt uh, to the production. Phase two, we convert a portion of our MOP into SOP, the higher value potassium sulphate product, um, and we add another million tonnes of de-icing salt on. And then finally, in phase four, we add an additional 270,000 tonnes of, of MOP, so in total, MOP and SOP were over a million tonnes um, of potash products and another two million tonnes of salt take us to four million tonnes of de-icing salt. And then that really is um, it's a multi-nutrient fertiliser business uh, with the salt business as well on the side with all of the revenue from the salt basically um, coming off the, the cost of production. We'd be right down at the bottom of the cost curve as a potash producer and with the location ideally um, located to supply the product into Morocco and uh, Africa itself. Um, and we'd be the only producer on the continent. So just looking back um, over the last two or three years, uh, the project has moved very quickly, um, made a lot of progress. The milestones as we've identified, uh, we've, we've typically hit. Um, which is you know, a great achievement. As I've said, a small team I joined in July of, of last year um, to bring my experience of, of operating Potash Mine and also uh, being part of the development team on a, on a large scale project, which was the, the Serious Minerals project, to actually you know, take the project forwards now um, in through the funding and then into construction and into operations. So the key sort of milestones, really, the feasibility study, middle of last year, um, and then social economic study we completed. November of last year, we completed our environmental and social impact assessment and, and submitted all of the documentation for our environmental permit. And at the same time, uh, submitted our uh, application for our mining license, for our mining permit. And we actually got that. We received that in, in February of this year. And that really is, you know, that gives us the permission now, the rights to mine um, all of the resource that we've identified. The initial mine plan that we're working to, uh, to develop is, is only for less than half, less than half of, of the resource that we have. But to achieve the mining uh, license in, in Morocco, you have to have previously held the exploration or research permits. So you have to have been able to, to drill uh, to identify a resource. You have to have a a resource identified and signed off to, to one of the, the global standards, the JORC in, in our case, and you have to have done a feasibility study to prove the economics of the project. So you don't get a license, a mining license in Morocco unless you've done all of that work, which basically is a, is a tick from the government that we've, we have a resource, a valid resource, and we have a project that it will economically stack up 
and now we we have the exclusive rights uh, to mine that resource in terms of the the milestones going forward so um the target for this year was was the mining permit first and, and we've, we've achieved that the environmental approval um is next and we we expect to to have that in the next month or two we we've sort of said in the said previously we'll get that in the first half of this year and, and we will do that very important to us is to bring in a strategic partner um either as a sort of equity partner or as a somebody that actually has an interest in the in the product more of an interest in the business uh, to help us with the development bring the the debt financing together and, and we we've been working on that now for some months uh, with our advisor talking to banks and export credit agencies so we can put in the uh, the structure for the for the debt funding that we need and then the target aggressive maybe but is to commence early construction works by the end of this year and you know that remains our target if we can get the funding in place um, during Q3. And then just uh, as a sort of, uh, last but one slide, uh, just a bit about what we're doing now and, and just mention the admission to AIM. Uh, we moved uh, to AIM recently and that really is, you know, given our size um, and strategy and, and where we sit on, on the development sort of timeline, really it gives us a much better access to a market environment which is suited to, to our requirements. We have to be able to move um, flexibly and and you know and quickly if we get opportunities to to get the funding in place that we need to develop this project. And the only you know, the only way for us to really um, get the true value that this project has is to get it into construction and build it, um, and and then get, get it into operations. So you know this aim gives us the opportunities we believe um, to be able to do that um, in in a much a more flexible way uh, than previously. Other things that are ongoing at the moment, we will be starting some site investigation work shortly. Um, so this is the more sort of detailed work uh, to give us the data to feed into the detailed design for the process plant and the site infrastructure. Um, so that work will be commencing soon on site. And then following that, we will be doing some, some more drilling. Uh, here we will be drilling down the length of the decline. So series of holes intersecting um, the strata at, at different points from the uh, near the top of the decline down to where it accesses the deposit so that we can feed that data into the detailed design for the decline, de-risk that even further because we'll have much more intimate knowledge of the geology. It is, from, from everything we know, fairly straightforward, but this allows us uh, to really fine tune the uh, the plan for the decline in terms of the you know the speed with which we can develop it um, and the cost of it. Work is ongoing with the detailed feasibility study for SOP, um, and that will give us great confidence then that we can we can add that uh, once we're up and running and producing MOP that there's the opportunity is real to uh, to convert some of that to SOP and and, and get the increased margins that that SOP uh, delivers. We'll be starting the detailed engineering design work. Um, really, that's on the back of the site investigation and the drilling, and bringing in new team members that we need to take us forwards um, into construct into the construction phase, which hopefully, as I've said, we're targeting uh, to start uh, by the end of the year. And now, I'll just leave leave this slide up. Um, this is the our values and the line. Um, that we'll always do the right thing and always do it in the right way. That is really important um, to us as a company. And I think, you know, should be particularly a focus of any, any mining company, any mining development. You can develop a mine um, and you can do it in the right way. You can take account of the environment. You've got to take account of the, the stakeholders, the local, uh, local residents and, and the area that you, you're developing. You know, everybody has to benefit from from the development it's not just a matter of um, increasing the share price at, at any cost it's actually more about doing it the right way and if you do things in the right way then actually you generate a lot more value as a result of that and that that really is key key to the way that we are conducting our business and, and will continue to do in the future and our and our values there spelling out the word right so respect integrity you know we are set, we do set challenging goals um, health and safety. I've I've spent thirty odd years in the mining industry, and 
and being safe and ensuring everybody um, that I'm responsible for is safe is it's not just part of the job, it's a way of life. And, and that's the only way for it to be. It's, it's a culture, it's the way you go about everything that you do. Uh, and again, that is, you know, that is really vitally important to us. And working together as a team, a small team, I think that's a feature of Emerson. It's been a small team, it's a close knit team, a very, very capable, highly motivated people um, whose only, only aim here is to, is to deliver this project and, and the real value that um, the, the Chemiset project can bring. So with that, um, I'll stop talking and just have a drink of water and then happily answer any questions that, uh, that anybody may have. Graham, thank you very much for that. Um, it's amazing progress you've made over the last uh, three years and, and clearly 2021 has got a lot of milestones in, so we expect uh, more news and, and more progress. As you said, we are now going to take questions. Uh, we've had a few come in ahead of time. If you would like to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. Um, just starting off um, with a question on, on fundraising, and we've had a couple on this subject, so I'll sort of amalgamate a couple together. You've had an attractive NPV, so have other companies um, which have failed to get funding for their projects. Um, you've obviously just had a recent fundraising, but how much further capital will you need to finance your um, CapEx plans, um, perhaps going through phases one and two? And how do you envisage that split will be between uh, debt and equity? And I guess the last part of that is and how much do you think you'll pay for that uh, for that debt? OK, so I think we'll, we'll focus on the you know, the feasibility study out, output, which is is a much more detailed piece of work than than the phase development that we've looked at recently. So to you know to fund the the full size project at seven hundred thirty five thousand tons of MOP, we're looking at just over four hundred million dollars um, of of capex. Um, our intention and expectation from our our advisor, who's working on the on the debt side of that, is that that we can get seven, a roughly 70-30 split debt to equity. We, we do want to bring in a strategic partner who will help us with the equity element of that. Um, and, and we're working on that at the moment. Um, in terms of the, the cost of that, well, I'm not going to, to quote a number, but we, we're actually working with um, export credit agencies um, who are very interested in the project and with the guarantees from, from ECAs that actually then reduces the risks for the banks and actually makes the, the money cheaper to, to borrow. So really it depends how, how we work through with that, but um, we, we are working with three um, ECAs um, and a, a number of, of large banks to put in a, put the structure together to, to get the debt in place. And then the equity will be, you know, as I say, around 30%. Um, but we're, we're targeting having a strategic um, to come on board and, and, and help with that aspect of it. And do you expect to have to close the environmental permits before um, uh, securing that uh, that debt or, or the next round of equity? Um, yes, yeah, so you know, we, we will. I mean, the environmental approval we expect to get in the next month or two, um, as I've said. Um, we Another aspect of, of, sort of closing the funding, obviously, is uh, do we need offtake arrangements in place for the, for the product? Um, that's typically the case. We've actually held off in, you know, in signing a, an easy offtake agreement, which we could do, um, because the offtake is actually a, a trump card in ongoing discussions with potential strategics who may well be interested in in the potash product. Um, and just quite an interesting point that, um, you know, it, the the production of potash around the world is 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 a fairly well controlled thing. There's some. A small number of very large producers who, who control the market to a greater or lesser extent, a greater extent actually. Um, but a lot of the fertilizer producers who they compete with um, have to buy their potash from their competitors in the fertilizer market. So the likes of Yara, for example, who have nitrogen, they want to produce MPK fertilizers, they have to buy their potash from their competitors. OCP is another example world's largest phosphate producer, they're producing MPK fertilizers, they're producing, they're bringing in the potash from their competitors in the fertilizer market. So us as a, as a 
relatively small but independent um, producer of, of potash, it gives us a, a, a real strategic uh, lever in, in ongoing discussions with some of these large um, fertilizer producers. So you know, they form part of the sort of group that we're talking to as, as, as being potential strategic partners. That's a nice link to the next question, Graham, which is, is there any pressure from the Moroccan authorities to do a deal with OCP and perhaps not the best terms for Emerson? No, no, there's, there's certainly not um, not any any pressure, um, you know, that we've that we've seen, and you know, the, the Moroccan authorities have been very um, helpful in, in working with us. You know, we've we've got our mining license, you know, that went through. Um, we're engaged with them. We've got a, a great team in Morocco, in country, who um, you know talk at all levels of of government, from the local um, through regional to national. And they're very supportive, you know, the authorities are very supportive of the project because of the, the economic benefits, the jobs it's going to bring, you know, it makes it will make a substantial positive impact on, on the region and on the country as a whole. Um, so no, there's no, no pressure in that regard. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I'm, as I said, I'm a mining guy, um, OCP have some interest in the same basin, the same deposit. Um, they've been looking at it themselves. Um, there's a lot of logic in it being developed, you know, as one, which is a lot more of an efficient way to go about doing it. Um, and given that OCP are importing potash, if there's a potash producer in the country, you know, it, it's pretty clear that, you know, all the logic points to there being some sort of um, partnership or, a, a you know, joint approach to, to make sure that, you know, the value is maximised for the country. So, but there's certainly no, you know, there's no negative uh, side to that from, from our point of view. Um, just opportunity and, you know, to, to get the best value from the, from the project. Okay. We've had uh, two or three people ask this same question. Can you give us a bit more detail on the timelines you're expecting for the separate phases one through four? Um, well, if we, so uh, we're, we're still focusing um, because we've got the detailed work to support it on developing the uh, the feasibility study level project, which is phase two effectively um, of the four phases. Um, if we ended up developing the, uh, the smaller phase one um, opportunity, then phase two would probably follow, you know, a couple of years, two to three years after that. Um, but once phase two is in, in operation, we're generating the cash for us to be able to add the SOP, uh, which is phase three and an additional salt plant you know, the, the cost of a million tonnes of salt from a capital point of view is around $25 million. So, you know, once we're at phase two level, then we can move pretty quickly into phase phase three um, and then, you know, forwards into phase four with the additional um, MOP production does would actually require accessing the southwest area of the deposit through two new declines. Um, so that would be a, you know, the time scale of that would be would be a couple of years uh, to do that development. Okay. Will sales into Morocco be at world prices or is there some government control on prices? No, there's there's no government control on prices. Um, as you know, as, as far as we're concerned, I mean, currently uh, they're importing at, you know, global prices, wherever, whichever market, you know, whichever producer they're taking those from. Um, obviously, if there were some engagement, some sort of partnership, joint venture, then, um, you know, that would come out in the mix as, as part of those discussions. But there would be no um, no damage to the project if we were selling the, the product to Morocco. Okay. The economics of this project look pretty attractive and your forecast EBITDA is also, again, pretty attractive. Why hasn't a larger established player tried to buy you out? Or perhaps they have. <laughs> um, no, nobody's tried to buy us out. Um, I suppose it's the, the larger producers um, and, and there have been conversations. Um, obviously, there's you know, details of which I, I, you know, I can't talk about. Um, there is interest in the project, largely because of where it is, you know, the location. It's you know, a strategically advantageous um, you know, position uh, to, to access the African market. Um, or, or the Brazilian market, you know, as I've said that, we can access that really cheaply from a logistical point of view. So the project is of interest. 
uh, to, to incumbent producers. Not so much the Canadians, you know, they're very large or the, or the Russians, but, you know, other producers, um, you know, we, we do have strategic advantages um, and the level of production is, you know, is significant enough to be of interest to people. Um, but nobody has, nobody has tried to buy us out. So. Okay. We've got, a, again, a couple of questions on this topic, which is um, executive holdings in Emerson. Uh, could you just remind us what the, um, the management team um, hold in terms of their shareholding in Emerson? Um, and could you also comment on how much have they got in options versus how much they've actually bought themselves? Um, and uh, there doesn't appear to be much, um, I guess, shareholder or buying from directors recently. Could you comment on why that is? Um, board and management have around 20% um, of, of the shareholding. Um, there are a, a reasonable number of, of options um, outstanding. Um, and I'm not going to, to comment particularly in, in terms of, of why um, board and management haven't been buying shares. Um, you know, the opportunities are limited at times because of, of being in closed periods. Uh, when we are, you know, have information with regard to to what you know the company is doing, um, and what may or may not happen, so you know the windows for that are reasonably limited. So it, you know it's not just a matter of of people choosing not to. Um, there, you know, there are restrictions in place in terms of you know when um, board and management are actually able to to, to trade in shares. Okay, I, I, there's a sort of a link question to this about retail investors. So you, you've raised money a couple of times without involving retail investors at prices that have been significant discounts to the prevailing market price. Um, would you perhaps try and involve retail investors going forward with any future raises? Certainly open to that, yes. Um, yeah, I, I, yes, we, we're open open to, to doing that and looking at that, and I, I, I do. Um, I do understand, you know, the, the views of the of the retail investors on that, um, and I, you know, it's certainly not something we'll just ignore. Um, and you know, if there's an opportunity to do that, then yes, uh, we would we would do that. Okay. Um, then looking at OCP, are you confident that the OCP group will take all of the MOP and SOP? Um, they would potentially take a good portion of it. Um, we don't need them to take it all. Um, there's a lot of markets um, in Europe. Um, certainly, if we're producing SOP, that's you know a, a premium product. Um, SOP is typically used on the higher value crops, so fruit, fruit and vegetables, a lot grown in in the region, um, in Europe and and North Africa. So there will be no shortage of customers for the for the product. Obviously, you know whatever we sell to sold in country would. Um, be at a better price for us in um, because of the logistics, but um, the, the numerous markets close by that we you know we would easily access. And in terms of the offtake, we we know there's at least one um, you know significant fertilizer trader who would snap our hands off if we offered them all the product tomorrow. So you know selling the product is not an issue. It's just a matter of of getting the best price. Okay. Could you deal with more than one partner for either a strategic partner link and or an offtake agreement? Potentially, yes. Um, there's no there's no reason that you know having one party involved excludes having another party. There's you know we we're certainly open to that, and um, we are talking to multiple um, multiple potential uh, partners at the moment. Uh, question here. I'm not sure you can answer, answer this, but I'll, I'll mention it anyway. Do you think there's a possibility that the environmental permit could come in this month? Um, uh, we, it'll be. We'll have it in the first half of the year, so it'd be very nice if it was this month. Um, I can't predict exactly how long it'll take the authorities to, uh, you know, to sign it off. So it's, you know, we've done we've done the work to a really good standard, higher than is actually uh, required in Morocco. Um, so you know, we're, we're confident it'll come through um, and you know, certainly in the next couple of months. Okay. Um, it, it feels like um, in, in order to progress this, you need strong and, and good relations with, with the government of Morocco. 
wondered if you could comment on the strength of those relationships that, that you have with the Moroccan government. Um, well, they're, they're, they're very good. Um, I've not engaged personally face to face with them. I've, I've been involved in, in, in meetings online. Um, but our team in Morocco engage regularly at all levels. Um, and we have an advisor who has, you know, contacts, uh, contacts at a very senior level within the government. So um, the relationship is, is very good. It's as good as it could be. Um, you know, our side of the bargain is we, we have to do, we have to build the trust by delivering what we say we're going to deliver and, and do it in the right way. Um, and that's what we have done and will continue to do. Um, and if we deliver the benefits through the project that have been identified, then we will continue to get the support um, and relations will be will be very good because the project is of, of benefit to to Morocco as a country. Okay, got two or three questions around the phased approach versus the feasibility study, and and really I think the question is saying or the questions are saying what would you prefer to do? Is it the phased approach or is it the the full um, the full project? Um, and are you doing the phased approach or considering the phased approach because um, perhaps you have difficulty raising the funding to do the full project? Um, I wondered if you explain a, your preference and, and uh, um, you know, how, how the phased approach came into being, I guess. Um, well, my, my, my strong preference and the, the preference of the, of the company as a whole is to um, develop the full size, so the feasibility study level. Um, you know, that makes more sense to, you know, go full scale straight away and then then do the expansions following that. Um, you know, I'm a mining guy. I like to produce as much as I possibly can. So that's, you know, that's my mindset. So I'd rather not start small. Um, but the reason we had a look at it was because it gives us that as an option. It's, it's simply that it wasn't driven by any doubt that we could raise the money. Um, it was to look at it as an option um, because I think... You know, it, you, you made a, it was one of the previous questions where you made a comment about, you know, other, other projects have had, you know, great NPVs but not raised the money. You know, I've already made the comment that the, the value of this is um, realised when we actually build it. So we have to be flexible and open to whatever route we need to take to get it built. Um, and having the optionality of a, of a smaller, uh, lower cost um, startup if we did need that, now we know we can do it. Um, so it's there as an option and, and to give us flexibility. And that's that's what it's all about is, is being open and flexible so that the end game is, you know, we get to the end game, which is building it. You know, that is all that matters is getting this built. Um, and, you know, having as, as much optionality and flexibility and getting to that point is, you know, is vital. And that's, you know, I see us as doing our job properly if we have every option available and open. And if an investor comes along and says, right, I'll give you the money to build a smaller scale project, you know, get cracking, then we would take that and do it. But, you know, the ideal from our point of view is to build the, um, you know, the full scale project and then expand that. Okay. A couple of years ago, there was an RNS about indicative funding offers from banks. Do those offers still stand? Um, no, they've they've fallen away. Um, we are probably engaging with um, some of the same banks or similar banks at the moment. Um, so we're we're working on that afresh at the moment. Okay, I think we've probably got uh, time for one more question. So I'm going to give you an, uh, one from a, someone who's obviously quite optimistic here. Um, so once everything is complete and up and running, and you've got substantial cash flows coming in, would Emerson look at expanding and butter up? buying other mines globally, or what's the plan on, I guess, returning those cash flows to, to shareholders? Um, well, I haven't spent too much time thinking about that, but I, I love the optimism. Um, I'm optimistic myself. Um, I think if we, we, we get, get into construction and get this, this project built, uh, we've got the expansion opportunities as I've talked about. Um, and yes, we probably would look further afield. Um, and why not? You know, there's, you know, the fundamentals, I, I, you know, at the beginning of the presentation, that's what I started with. We're going to have to produce more food. The only way to do that is with fertilizer, increasing quantities of fertilizer. It's a great business. There are other opportunities out there to develop projects. 
Um, there's a lot of, of you know potash projects out there. Um, you know, I believe the Emerson team we have the capability to deliver this one. So I would say that we have the capability to deliver more projects um, and maybe more so than the people who are trying to develop them at the moment. So, you know, I think there are opportunities for us uh, to expand, but at the end of the day as well, we're, we're here to deliver the, the best value we can for our shareholders um, and ultimately pay dividends. And that's, you know, that's, that's what, we're, what we're doing. Graham, thank you very much for that. Um, we are now coming towards the end of our time uh, with Emerson PLC today. I'd like to thank Graham for that clear presentation and for answering all those questions uh, so clearly. would also like to remind people that uh, when they exit today, there'll be a, a, an exit survey. And if they wouldn't mind uh, answering those questions, it does. Uh, it's really much appreciated by, uh, by management. Um, and just a reminder of some webinars we've got coming up this week on with an EXO on Thursday and then the following week with Dialyte and, and Myriad. And if you've got any questions relating to uh, this uh, webinar or future webinars, please um, email them to info at yellowstoneadvisory.com. So just like to say thank you and, and thank you again, Graham, for, for presenting today. It's a pleasure. Thank you.